Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks uh, so much for uh, traveling across the uh, country. Um, everyone has come together. The last time we were uh, together was uh, back in December, uh, and I think this is the largest gathering yet. Uh, I know that some of you really like being at the uh, War Museum. Uh, we've done that a few times, but some of the feedback that uh, we receive, I think it was the, uh, the demolition and the explosions that were happening subsurface that uh, got a few folks uh, going, and certainly it uh, brought back some memories for me too. Mais uh, je pense que nous avons un bon uh, uh, endroit ici à l'hôtel, and I hope that everyone is, is comfortable, and I know that some folks have had some interesting travel journeys to get here. Um, I do want to uh, just remind that we are here uh, in, a, in an inclusive environment to inform uh, what's been going on for the past while, to share, and, and I recognize that so much of the great work happens when we're away from this formal environment, when you're out there uh, socializing and, and probably upstairs uh, socializing, and we're also here to listen. Et c'est pourquoi nous avons un, un jour et demi ensemble, plus que la dernière fois. Uh, we have more time together, uh, more than we have had before. In the past, we've done day-long sessions, and uh, at, as in response to uh, your request, we've gone for a day and a half. So there's time to, uh, to have uh, uh, smaller great, uh, breakout sessions for discussion, and then uh, for folks to come back again tomorrow morning uh, to, uh, to actually uh, have a great discussion on, on what folks uh, wish to do. Uh, but also, I just want to say for all of you, I recognize that your presence here is a continuation of your service. The fact that so, much, so many of you joined long ago, the fact that you are here leading the various veterans associations, you are there because you care. But I also recognize that many of you here have deployed you protected Canada from the other side of the world in places like the Balkans, the Middle East, Africa, Korea, or Afghanistan. And some of you protected Canadians right here at home, whether that was the Winnipeg floods, the ice storm, and just like those young sailor soldiers, airmen and women in Fort McMurray today. So I'd just like to ask all of you to stand up and we're going to share a moment of silence. A moment of silence for our fallen comrades, for those who paid the ultimate price for peace and security, and for Canada. We will remember them. Nous nous souviendrons dans eux. You have Catherine Spencer Ross. Catherine, any administrative uh, points before we kick off? Great. So to kick off the summit, and I know everyone has the agenda there, and we will use that agenda as a guide. And I know there's some folks who want to make additional statements. We will inject them through the uh, program. But to kick, uh, kick things off, I would like to invite our Minister of Veterans Affairs and also the Associate Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Kent Hare, to come up and address the assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to tell you that since we met back in December, the minister has been able to get out and visit the troops who are in Europe, uh, uh, a number of bases, but also to some of the offices across the country, to, to our, our uh, long-term care facilities like Sunnybrook uh, and St. Anne's Hospital. And let me tell you, we are fortunate to have a minister of his great leadership and quality. Minister, welcome.
Well, thanks, General. Welcome, everyone. I appreciate that all of you have taken time to come together to share information on supporting veterans and their families. You have volunteered to support the community of veterans you represent, and I would like to thank each of you for the differences you make in the lives of those who you have served. I would also like to thank Karen McCrimmon, the Parliamentary Secretary to this department, for being here today and for taking a leadership role in working directly with all of you, our stakeholders. Karen's military background and service gives her a unique ability to guide the work we are here to do together. Similarly, I would like to thank Catherine Spencer Ross and her team for all the work behind the scenes to bring us together today. Let's offer them our sincere thanks. My name is Kent Hare and I was born in 1969. For my entire life, I have lived in peace and security, which I owe to the men and women who served and sacrificed for this country. From Vimy Ridge to Juneau Beach, Korea to the peacekeeping efforts of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the Gulf War and Afghanistan to our current efforts in the Middle East. When the nation called, they deployed for extended periods and they endured dangerous and difficult situations. They made sacrifices in order to achieve the missions our nation required of them to keep Canada safe. They did it their very best to protect our great nation. We owe them all a debt of gratitude. What many of them experienced and endured was and is extremely difficult. And while they ensured our freedom, we must ensure that they get the supports they need to rebuild their lives. Our strategy for following through on this is rooted in the core values of care, compassion, and respect. We care for those who have served and for their families and survivors. We will show compassion for their needs. We respect them both in our day-to-day -day interactions and by honoring them through commemoration. When we met at the first stakeholder summit back in December, I was new in the position. Since then, we have moved forward on the ambitious mandate that Prime Minister Trudeau has handed to me. With Budget 216, we took historic steps to restore critical access to services and do more to ensure the long-term financial security of veterans. We committed to reopening and staffing offices in Charlottetown, Sydney, Cornerbrook, Windsor, Thunder Bay, Saskatoon, Brandon, Prince George, and Kelowna so that veterans can more easily access the services they have earned. We are also opening a new office in Surrey and expanding outreach in the territories so that we can better serve veterans living there. We are hiring additional case managers and frontline staff to reduce the veteran to case manager ratio to 25 to 1. When I came into this job, veteran to staff ratios were much higher than this. Drawing the line here will speed up service delivery and get veterans and the families the help they need when they need it. We will put more money into the pockets of veterans by increasing the disability award to $360,000, expanding access to the permanent impairment allowance, and increasing the earning loss benefit from 75% to 90% of a member's pre-release salary. We're expanding access to the last post fund by increasing the state exemption from roughly $12,000 to $35,000 to give more veterans a dignified burial. Today you will be briefed in more detail on these items and you'll have the opportunity during breakout sessions to discuss and share your perspectives. 
While we have begun important work on many things, there is much, much more to be accomplished. And I can assure you, we have just gotten started. I know that many of you have questions about pension options and a return to the pension for life. I remain committed to all of the items in my mandate letter. Back in December, I heard from many of you that you wanted us to take the time to get it right on financial security, including pensions, and that you wanted to be involved in developing that plan. We listened, and this is part of why we are here today. In fact, there are several outstanding items in my mandate letter that we would like to hear from you on. Centers of Excellence, the Education Program, Marriage After 60 Clause, to name a few. That is why we recently created the six advisory committees that will go forward with this work. Policy, Service Excellence, Mental Health, Care and Support, Families, and Commemoration. The purpose of these committees is to allow me to gather input to ensure we are moving in a direction that will make a real and substantial difference in the lives of veterans and their families. But I also want to be clear that we will continue to listen to all interested and engaged stakeholders, regardless of their involvement of any of these groups. Please reach out to my office if you, if you would like to share your thoughts and ideas. After six months in this job, I have been able to meet some of the 135,000 veterans who receive benefits from us and some of the more than 500,000 who have not yet come to us for assistance. With few exceptions, they are very proud of their service and like many of you, they miss military life, the sense of family and the strong identity that comes from wearing the uniform. As many of you know, I was named Associate Minister of National Defense. And despite being an above average player at the board game risk, with a 30% success rate in games of three or more people, that is not why I've actually been given the job. I am not here to plan missions, but rather to work with Minister Sejan to close the seam from military to civilian life, to help veterans transition and find new purpose where they are no longer able to serve. Much of our work here today will feed into those conversations. The toughest year for an NHL hockey player is the first one after he stopped playing, when he hangs up the jersey for the last time. Oftentimes, he will have spent his entire life knowing what he was going to do from the age of six. And I understand that. I grew up playing hockey. The first year with my disability was the toughest year for me. I no longer went to the dressing room to put on the jersey. That was it. Many veterans spend their adult lives in service and find themselves having to take off the jersey. This is difficult. That is why the work, our department, and with all of you in this room is so important. I have had the privilege of meeting the public servants who serve veterans in our offices from coast to coast to coast and in the headquarters in Charlottetown. They come from different backgrounds and experiences, but what is wonderful to see is that they share in the commitment and pride in serving the veterans. I share their pride in service and commitment to you. We have a very unique department with a noble mission to serve those who served and sacrificed for our nation. I admire their professionalism and commitment to finding new ways to do better. Under the former government, we, we stopped reaching out with veteran satisfaction surveys. The last satisfaction survey was conducted in 2010, so we don't have hard data that we desperately need to understand how frontline services are being delivered. We'll reinstate this survey so that we get feedback from veterans on their experiences in dealing with VAC, the good and the bad. 
That way we can keep doing what we do well and work on what needs to be improved. On that note, I would like to say how much I appreciate the work of our department does proactively to determine whether a veteran's circumstances have changed, whether they have moved, changes within their families, or whether their situation has improved or sometimes deteriorated. We do this by phone, email, and by mail to ensure we have tried all avenues to make contact. When veterans respond, nearly 25% of the time, the department provides additional or enhanced support. I myself am in yearly contact with the provincial government in Alberta relating to the services I receive from them for my disability. While I don't always enjoy filling out forms, Often my response has led to a meeting and to improved services. It is my hope that veterans experience the same result as, as because of our outreach. Before I finish, I would like to say a little more about the core values of care, compassion, and respect, and how I see these values guiding our department. We heard from you at the last summit that veterans seeking assistance should, in more cases, be given the benefit of the doubt that the conditions they experience years after service be accepted as service-related. We listen, and we are changing the way we assess claims with an evidence model for adjudication that takes into account the service member's trade and specialties so that if a veteran was parachuting or diving, maybe working with the explosives, and in later years, experience conditions like hearing loss, muscular, skeletal, and mental health injuries, they may be approved for benefits years after their service has ended, even if there was nothing reported in their military medical file. In fact, our new model has already increased approvals by 10%. Everyone who joined the forces was accepted to serve because they were in top mental and physical shape. Approximately a quarter of every year's retirees are medically releasing. More who left healthy are coming into VAC years after their retirement seeking support. 30% of retirees have a difficult time transitioning. We need to focus on efforts on these members so they can transition can be, and that can be successful as others. I have said before that when a soldier serves, their entire family serves with them. This is also true for members transitioning out. It is often hard on their family. We must assist veterans in finding their new normal so they have a purpose, a reason to wake up every morning, a roof over their heads, the family and medical support that they need to stay healthy and with sufficient financial security. I have asked the Deputy Minister to speak to the well-being model and strategy later on this morning. And hey, it's great working for the General. We're working together with the General. It really is a partnership, and I can say, like I've alluded to in this speech, working to, for the, with the public service has been one of the big thrills of being uh, the Minister of Veterans Affairs. I have also been tasked, tasked the department with four reviews to ensure that our benefits properly support you. The first on medical marijuana should be complete before the summer break. The department is working on a service delivery review to ensure we are doing our best to provide excellent service. Work is well underway. Next, the department has embarked on a deliberate and concentrated effort to simplify financial benefits, fill the gaps, and address those benefits that have not fully met your needs. Alongside the Canadian Armed Forces, we need to look at new ways and means by which we can close the seam, and that includes looking at how CISIP supports are serving men and women and veterans. In addition to this, I have appointed a secretariat that will focus on three areas, career transition and employment, 
support for veterans, families and survivors, and addressing veteran homelessness through more support for homeless and those at risk of becoming homeless. My intent is that these reviews, along with your contributions, will all come together to provide the, the right solutions to achieve my mandate and fix some of the key gaps. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today in Ottawa and for joining us online from across the country. Thank you to Karen McCrimmon and my entire team in my department. I look forward to the conversations to be had over the next two days and the weeks and months ahead as we work together to move forward on our mandate items and develop good public policy guided by care, compassion, and respect. It's a true joy to be here with you today. Let's work openly, constructively, towards positive outcomes. And let's understand it's not easy and Rome wasn't built in a day, but I believe truly in my heart we've made significant progress so far. And over the course of the next uh, coming months and years, we will be in a better place together. Thank you so much.